Good evening. Thank you for joining us tonight for the first CPD event in the St. George Hospital Grand Rounds Practice Nurse Series for 2024. Tonight's topic is navigating chronic disease services and supporting your patients. My name is Michaela and I'm the Practice Nurse Liaison Program Officer with Central and Eastern Sydney PHN. Before we begin, I would like to start by acknowledging the traditional custodians and sovereign people of the land across which we work. I recognise their continuing connection to land, water and community and pay respects to elders past, present and emerging. I also extend that respect to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people joining us tonight. The practice support team, along with myself here at Central and Eastern Sydney PHN, are available to support you in your role as nurses. So please get in contact with us if you would like any assistance or you have any questions. So I'd now like to introduce you to our speakers for this evening. We have Kylie Turner, the Chronic Kidney Disease CNC, Glenn Paul, Cardiology CNC, and Denise Craig, CNC for Endocrine. We also have Robin Hamblin, who's the Acting Program Manager for South Eastern Sydney Health Pathways. I'll now hand over to you, Kylie. Thank you. Uh, welcome all to this evening's um, presentation where we will be discussing um, a uh, patient who um, has all of the chronic diseases that we're um, talking about tonight. Um, I hope you enjoy the presentation. Just a little bit about a background of how the um, Grand Rounds came about. Um, the Integrated Care Chronic Diseases Network is a collective group of staff from both primary health, um, the hospital, um, other community agencies uh, such as Health Pathways, along with the um, Integrated Care Unit um, and general practitioners. This group came together back in 2017 and it was a means of integrating and networking and trying to improve the care for our patients. Um, we came up with some aims and goals of this group, including supporting the JMOs in their transfer of care summaries, pretty much known as the discharge summary to general practice. Um, we also are looking to help support general practice to navigate hospital services. So the presentation such as tonight and also the general practitioner grand rounds that are done online monthly as well uh, in the hope that we can reach that goal. We're also looking to help support communication between primary care and hospital clinicians and promote some cultural change and improve chronic disease management for our patients. Um, I invite any of you to join this group. We meet on a bi-monthly basis online. Um, I'm more than happy to share the terms of reference of the group with you. So if following this presentation, this is something that interests you or you just want to come along and listen to a meeting and see if it's something that you're interested in being a part of, um, I'm more than happy for my email address to be shared and um, for you to be able to uh, email me your interest. Just a little bit about chronic disease management, um, how we sort of see it from a hospital setting is that it starts in primary care. We have the hospital who take a small portion of the middle of the um, care for these patients. And then again, the patients are back in the primary care setting. How do patients get to the hospital? So there's a couple of different means of how these patients um, come into our services. So either by the emergency department where they've been referred in from general practice um, from the emergency department where they've come in via an ambulance, emergency department where a patient may have just self-presented, and then there's also the outpatient department where referrals may be received from the general practitioner for patients to be able to be linked into different services. So that's how pretty much all of our patients come into the hospital service. Just going to hand over to Glenn now. Glenn, you're on mute. Sorry, someone. Um, yeah, thanks very much, uh, Kylie. I just thought I'd extend a little bit on um, on just the concept of chronic disease management and why it's something which which we should all form a partnership in and 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 have a network of care for. And as you can see from this slide, like with with all chronic diseases, whether that be respiratory, cardiac, neuro, renal. Um, they've all got a similar presentation and that's of like a pre-trajectory illness where you have risk factors, um, 
progressing on to a crisis phase, um, a stabilisation, and then normally characterised by by periods of instability, um, followed by recovery. But on the whole, there's like a downward tra trajectory over time. So I suppose such complexity with the disease state requires um, um, services that can respond to those changing needs over time from the initial diagnosis through to the end stage uh, disease. Next slide, please. Thanks. So in order to respond, it is a complex system. And as you can see, um, there's various, um, from a hospital perspective, there's various inpatient, outpatient and home-based services. But it's at the cent centre of that, as Kylie pointed out in her slide, is that before the presentation, um, the patients are coming from primary care, they come to a hospital and then they'll go back to primary care. So I, I think the complexity of this the system does require some integration. Um, and, and that integration is a focus not only uh, in New South Wales, but Australia-wide and indeed worldwide. Next slide, please. So it's part of Australia's long-term health plan, integrating care. Um, um, it's part of the New South Wales Health Strategic Framework for integrating care. And really it's about overcoming barriers between primary and tertiary care. And the key aspect of that is going, is going to be com communication and networking. And the um and and the and the like assumption the truth is that many of the hospital admissions for chronic illness could be prevented and managed in the community. Next slide, please. Why that's important is because you know I had to say it work in the hospital. That hospitals are hazardous. Um, we know that there's considerable risk, particularly for older people who are presenting to hospital. And this is some data from the Australian Commission of Safety and Quality in Healthcare, um, just just highlighting the high rates of infection and hospital acquired complications, which are associated with hospital admission. Next slide, please. That data is really replicated. That's our experience at St George Hospital with high incidence of pressure area, inpatient falls, hospital acquired infections, and medication incidents. Next slide, please. So, you know, I always say that, you know, like every day out of hospital is a good day. Um, and we know that with a aging population, we have um, advanced age, um, associated with that is certain, certainly functional limitations, a degree of cognitive impairment and frailty, which puts people at great risk when they come into hospital when they're old, older in an unfamiliar environment. It's associated with greater morbidity mortality. And even though the hospital is a, a traditional model for Australia's medical care, um, it's not an ideal environment for like many patients, and that's increasingly recognised. Um, whilst it's hospital admissions often necessary it's difficult to ignore these risks and and certainly when i'm um in the emergency department in the registrar and we're considering an admission under cardiology i'll always sort of say well there's a risk to this person com coming into hospital so what can be done as an outpatient and if they do need to come in as an inpatient we need to recognize that those risks of falls and infections uh before we make a decision about the best place to uh, carry out the treatment. And um, and really it should be, you know, like how do we inform people about those risks? We often for inform people about the risks associated with procedures and medications, but actually um, should hospitalization be viewed as a procedure or intervention, particularly those elderly patients who are, you know, more prone to getting confused of a night time, slipping on a slippery floor, unfamiliar bathroom environments, and hard floors, et cetera. Next slide, please. So, so given that complexity, given given the the illness trajectory of chronic disease or chronic diseases and the amount of people that are involved in their care, it it's really rec recognized as a, a complex adaptive system. Well, it's a complex system, but it needs to be adaptive and sort of in this diagram, I really like this diagram because at the moment, all those all those players, the HCPs, uh, healthcare professionals, nurses, the patient and the care partner, and importantly, the care partner's interaction with each other between the patient and the care partner, 
Um, if they're closed, there's very little communication, there's very little networking, and you have siloed healthcare. Next slide, please. And there's a, a limited flow of information. And really the idea with a complex adaptive system is that with that complexity, it really needs more communication and needs those o open borders. Um, and certainly that's the aim of, of, of our, our network and that's the aim of, of a presentation such as this. One, it's to provide some information about our experience with the case study. But I suppose more importantly, it's about getting to know practice nurses, getting to know our colleagues um, who are looking after our patients before and after their hos hospital admission. Next slide, please. So a simple system does not adapt or change. So we've got ourselves a complex system. We've got, um, we've got a complex um, array of chronic disease conditions which have an illness trajectory that changes over time. So in order to sort of in order to sort of address those needs and to work together, um, all forms of communication networking are really important. So we look forward to presenting this today. Thanks, Colleen. Now we'll just hand over to Denise. Uh, yes, I'm presenting um, the case study, NG, who's a 76-year-old male. He presented to the emergency department with shortness of breath, tachycardia and hyperglycemia. On arrival to ED's blood glucose level was 14.4 millimoles per litre. He was symptomatic of hyperglycemia and um, NG reported that he'd had a recent HbA1c done that was 11%. Um, he was on obtusil and insulin um, daily at breakfast time and on a diabetes medication, linagliptin. Um, NG lived at home with his elderly wife or, and um, uses a walking stick um, for mobility. He's normally independent with his activities of daily living, although he does rely on his wife because um, he's got um, impaired vision. So in terms of past medical history, he's got stage 5 CKD, secondary to diabetes, hypertension, ageing nephrosclerosis, cardiorenal syndrome, uh, metabolic syndrome, hypertension, diabetes, ischemic heart disease. He's had diabetes for six, uh, six years, type 2 diabetes. Um, he's also got um, atrial fibrillation, CCF, um, previous pulmonary embolism and consequently on um, lifelong warfarin. And um, from uh, as a result of retinopathy and maculopathy, he's um, legally blind. So in terms of um, his diabetes and the considerations um, that we'd look at um, since he's arrived in hospital, he's got um, poor glycemic control. So he's obviously, um, with his blood sugar levels, they were ranging fasting from 12 to 15 millimoles per litre and pre-meals were 11 to 18. So with the um, HbA1c measurement, which is measuring um, NG's average blood glucose level over a three-month period, uh, the 11% is clearly indicative of poor glycemic control. Ideally, um, we'd want a target of less than 7%, but obviously that HbA1c target needs to be individualised um, for patients, for, for people, depending on comorbidities, um, you know, their age, um, prognosis, things like that. And there's certainly some factors that can increase or decrease the HbA1c, which does make it um, less reliable, sorry, reliable, such as acute blood loss, um, chronic liver disease, or iron deficiency anemia. But if you're looking at NG's blood sugar levels, then you can see that actually the the range um, does clearly correlate with uh, an elevated HbA1c. So in terms of um, when he'd been in a couple of days, he was actually changed over to Novomix 30 insulin um, twice a day. So this change of insulin provided him with um, some rapid-acting insulin. 
in addition to sort of an intermediate longer acting insulin, which will um, help to improve his blood glucose levels. Um, and similar to the obtisolin insulin he was on um, before it came on, in to hospital, the Nova Mix 30 is um, available in a disposable pattern, which will make it much easier um, for his wife to continue to, you know, administer his insulin um, with a system that she is familiar with. Sorry, I just have to have a bit of water. Um, and so... NG's wife had been administering insulin for about 12 months and she also did his blood sugar levels. Um, I have a home care package and she was getting some um, regular daily assistance to, to help manage him. So um, we've got uh, on that slide just some um, diabetes self-care um, education um, discussion points that I'll talk a little bit about in a minute. Um, so when we um, look to provide diabetes education to patients, there's a number of self-care behaviours that are really important if we want our education um, to be effective um, and successful, really. So things like um, understanding the diabetes condition in order for the patient to make um, informed health and lifestyle changes. So, you know, they need to learn more about their diabetes, making appropriate food choices, um, staying active if, if able, monitoring blood glucose levels and using the results to improve um, their, their diabetes management, taking medication um, and making sure that the, the medication that they're taking is appropriate for where their blood sugars are trending at the moment. Um, and importantly, problem solving. Um, you know, people with diabetes, they live with this condition you know, 24-7, 365 days a year. So they're, they're faced, um, you know, their, their blood glucose trend is in a straight line. They're constantly going high and low. And so um, our patients have to deal with, with those fluctuating blood sugar levels. And um, more importantly, looking after their emotional health. Um, we know that, you know, uh, often um, people with diabetes have got other comorbidities, um, with diabetes um, comes a, a burden, diabetes burden, you know, increased diabetes distress and, um, you know, there's a, a certainly an incidence of um, depression. And um, in terms of another self-care behaviour is trying to reduce the um, risks of chronic complications, which um, unfortunately NG presented with. Um, so what I thought, when we... Um, I referred patients in um, in in the hospital. Um, what I suppose there's a lot of different aspects to cover, and so pretty much the information that we give to the patient um, we call survival information. The whole focus of the information is to give them what they need to know to be able to safely manage their diabetes. So a lot of the emphasis. Um, with self-care is follow-up um, in terms of outpatient follow-up and obviously with their ongoing management um, with the, the G, GP and um, the practice nurses. Um, so we would go through um, with the patient um, just sort of explaining what diabetes is. Um, and looking at NG, um, you know, these days with technology, things can be, um, you know, greatly improved for people with diabetes in terms of meters and, and just even insulin delivery devices. So there is a uh, meter available um, on the market um, called CareSense Voice, and it's actually a meter that um, will verbally prompt um, the person doing the blood sugar uh, with the steps and it does even give you the result. Um, and the glucose strips for the Kessens voice is um, subsidised on NDSS, so that's even better. Um, we've got meters available and I'm sure if you wanted to get one from your for your patient, if you rang um, the Kessens person, the rep, um, then they would likely send you the meter out. Um, so we would just go through all the aspects of blood glucose monitoring, record keeping, just sort of setting them up with their, their um, finger pricking device. And 
sometimes, you know, which you would have found yourselves with your patients, some of these finger prickers are quite difficult to use. Um, so sometimes, you know, we need to, to source um, other, other options that they're going to, to find um, easier to use. Uh, in terms of um, insulin therapy, um, we're fortunate with the, the uh, inpatients. If they're here for a couple of days, then we can get them injecting. Um, so they've actually got an opportunity to practice. Um, so we would, um, in most cases, give them the disposable um, pen to use. Um, unfortunately, like a lot of you would be familiar with the national shortage of the um, rice egg flex touch pen which has um, created some problems for us and no doubt for some of your patients where if they're on the rise of deg insulin they need to be using one of the Novo pens which adds another complexity with patients having to load cartridges into the pen um, which you know for some people can be easy but for others with um, dexterity issues, visual impairment and you know, some cognition issue, it becomes very problematic. So there's certainly even situations where we've had to talk to the um, doctor's medical team and get them to consider putting the patient on a different insulin. With the injection technique, um, you know, and again, I, I know that I'm telling you things that you'd probably be seeing with your, your group of patients, but... One of the first things when they come into hospital we do is always look at their injection sites because um, a number of patients, they, they often will inject in the same area and they get a, a build-up of um, lipohypertrophy, like um, lumpy fatty scarring. And if, um, you know, sometimes when a patient is um, walking down a corridor, even if they've got like a cotton T-shirt on, you can actually see a lump on the abdomen looks like a little hernia and it's actually just um, scar tissue and if they're injecting into that scar tissue, the insulin's not going to get absorbed. So we would tell them to use another area, stay away from the um, scarring for about two to three months and it should clear, but more importantly, they'd need to... Um, you need to consider reducing their insulin because all of a sudden when they're injecting somewhere else, the insulin starts to work and people are at risk of hypoglycemia. Um, needle length size, that's another great consideration for our patients, particularly if they haven't been in to see you for a while. Some of them aren't familiar with the newer, smaller um, needle size recommendations. Um, so, you know, with insulin pens, we've got available short needles, four, five and six. So we would really not want someone come, you know, coming in saying they're using size eight. Again, they're just increasing their risk of um, intramuscular injections. Um, so in terms of um, healthy, uh, healthy eating, carbohydrate spacing, it's really important that um, our patients are seeing the dietitian um, because. Um, you know, often we need to make sure that they're up to date with information. So NG, his wife was very welcoming of any new information and we were fortunate with um, his wife that she'd actually um, was on insulin herself. So she was, she was really familiar with the, the whole sort of routine. With carbohydrates, we know for people on insulin and some um, oral diabetes medication that can cause hypoglycemia that people... With diabetes, are generally recommended to eat carbohydrates every uh, two and a half to three hours through the day. So people, um, it's just really important for them that they have breakfast, morning tea, lunch, afternoon tea, dinner and supper. Um, and obviously seeing the dietitian, you know, particularly if they're looking at, at, you know, not adding any extra weight, then, you know, the different sort of food nutrients and composition is really important. Hypoglycemia, hyperglycemia, we certainly um, focus on, on the side effects of insulin um, and for more importantly for people who are driving, um, making sure that they're aware of the licensing requirements that you need to drive above five. 
also when you hop into a car, it, the expectation is, is that you do a finger prick um, and um, that, you know, if you're going on a drive for greater than two hours, then you stop and do a finger prick. So that's really, really important. Um, and it's just a, just a good sort of tool to sort of keep reinforcing with your patients the importance of carrying um, hypo food on them. So I just um, have to skim over because I'm aware of time restraints. Uh, we talk about hypoglycemia, sick day management. Um, look, physical activity for a lot of our um, patients, it's not a concern. However, um, you know, a lot of elderly patients, you know, look, certainly there's active ones, but other ones, even if they're pottering around in the garden, they forget the importance of eating. Um, so again, just reinforcing with them um, you know, the, the need to eat regularly. Um, so with our patients, um, when they're discharged um, NG, he would be offered a follow-up appointment in the diabetes centre and depending on their um, requirements, um, they might have, um, you know, one, two appointments and we w might see them, you know, six weeks later, six months later. It's very um, dependent on the, what the patient's willing to do. Um, they'll get a six, generally get a six week follow up in the um, medical clinic in outpatient department. And uh, that's at the registrar clinic and the, cl the registrar has seen them in the ward. So they've got the continuity in that appointment. And then if they needed or your GP wanted them seen um, again, they'd be referred to the um, Monday um, diabetes clinic. Um, so obviously like the self-care behaviours, they're person-centred and, you know, shared goals of care. Um, so like in trying to sort of um, meet the needs of the patient, you know, the the integration of care between primary care, um, yourselves, our diabetes centre at the hospital and the patient is really um, sort of pivotal. Um, so in terms of... Um, Accessing the diabetes service, if you um, feel that your um, patient, um, you know, would really benefit from a self-management review, um, all those additional things that perhaps um, you don't have the time to do or you'd like us to give it in a bit more detail, then you, you know, feel um, free to phone them. And I think as the future slides that we'll look at, we've got some contact details. Um, so thank you. Thanks, Denise. Um, so I just want to cover the renal aspect of this particular patient's um, admission. So when he presented this time, his kidney function was down to 10%. So he was now fitting into the stage five category. Um, lucky for him and for us, he was already known to one of the nephrologists within the department but prior to him coming in, he was sitting a higher um, EGFR, so didn't require um, planning for renal replacement therapy at that stage. But now that he's now um, fallen into that 10% category, we really need to have a plan of what this gentleman is going to do in terms of renal replacement therapy in the future. Um, he was commenced on Aranest, which were, is um EPO, erythropoietin, which is given often to our patients in that stage five category, um, but he was yet to administer a dose. And I think that was purely just because um, he was probably administered during a clinic appointment and there might not have been a lot of follow-up in terms of um, how he was going to administer this at home or how his wife or whoever was going to administer it, how it was all going to happen. So we were able to, again, look into that while he was in this admission. Um, he'd been saving his arm, which um, I don't know if you've ever had patients come into the clinic where they might tell you that they're saving an arm. Um, and that's basically just meaning that no vena puncture, no blood pressure or cannulas to be put in that arm. And that's just because we're saving that arm for a possible future um, arterial venous fistula creation, which can be used for um, hemodialysis. Uh, and then during this admission, he was referred to myself for some education and then I was able to also link him with other staff within the renal department. So in terms of his kidney disease, as I mentioned, he's now at that stage where we need to have a bit of a plan in place in terms of what sort of renal replacement therapy he 
um, is going to possibly have in the future, if any. And that is part of the conversation that I do have with the patients when I see them. So all patients that are known to the renal department at St. George are generally referred to me anywhere from about a kidney function of 15% and below. And that's purely for them to come along um, for me to sort of gather a whole lot of information, including a lot of social information, um, as well as uh, physical information about the patient to try and sort of come up with a plan of what would be maybe in this patient's best interest in terms of what renal replacement therapy we might be looking at in the future. Now, those conversations don't happen just with myself. They've obviously occurred usually with the patient's nephrologist. And there's also another array of CNCs within our department who they may be known to as well. But the initial conversations, we usually just cover all bases. And then usually from that conversation, we can usually gather an idea of what they would prefer to have in the future. And then we can sort of start them on a bit of a pathway. So in this patient's um, considerations, he was deciding between having a therapy at home um, where his wife was able to assist him with to save him having to come into uh, the hospital to have treatment. Um, or he was also um, uh, considering possibly not having dialysis at all, which is a, not an uncommon um, occurrence, particularly in patients of his age bracket and with his uh, comorbidities. The idea of possibly having um, be attached to a machine for the rest of their life is to, usually a point for where, where they start to consider um, the quality of their life over their quantity of life. And that's a com conversation that we can also have with them. So in his case, he did decide that dialysis was something that he would pursue in the future. And then we were looking at possibly having a peritoneal dialysis pathway, um, which meant then that I was able to refer him on to the perit peritoneal dialysis CNC. And she was able then to further educate him around that preferred treatment. Um, we were also able to provide him with some education around Aranesp, which is um, the drug that I mentioned earlier. Now, Aranesp is a form of erythropoietin, and that helps a patient to um, their body to reproduce red blood cells. Because um, as a patient with renal disease, um, they have that diminished ability. Um, we were also able to link this patient to a program known as the Wellbeing Program. Now, this is a community program. I don't know if it's well known amongst the practice nurses. Um, I'm not 100% sure that you can directly refer patients to this program, but I'm more than happy for anyone to contact me and then I can refer the patient to the program if they're known to our renal service. So this program is um, designed for patients who are beginning on um, Aranesp and they help to educate them on self-administering this drug at home. On top of that, they also provide education around end-stage kidney disease, including nutrition, um, medication administration, um, and just general health coaching. Um, so it is a very good program. Uh, the patient was also referred to the renal dietitian, as Denise has mentioned uh, with the endocrine side of things. Diet is really important from a renal perspective, and it's really important that at any stage of their kidney disease that they are referred to the dietitian so she can provide education around dietary restriction, restrictions and also around nutrition assessment. It's not, very, it's not uncommon for patients at um, this particular kidney function to not want to be eating or have taste aversions. Um, they may also have issues with potassium. They also, may also have issues with phosphate. So the dietitian is able to cover all of that with their education and be able to look at the patient solely and give them a uh, diet that's suited to their needs. They also get referred to our renal social worker. So it is a multidisciplinary um, referral when they get referred to my clinic, which my clinic is known as the Kidney Disease Education Clinic. And the social worker will conduct a psychosocial assessment. Um, the social worker can help with things like applying for uh, my age care, they can also help in terms of um, accommodation if required, um, also around possibility of transport, if transport is going to be something that's required in the future. Um, if they were to do a, um, say, a hospital-based or a satellite-based dialysis. 
Um, when this patient was discharged, we made him a follow-up appointment at that particular clinic, the Kidney Disease Education Clinic, where this gentleman was able to catch up with not only myself, the social worker and the dietitian, but we were also able to have the peritoneal dialysis CNC check in with him there. Now this clinic's run out of the hospital. Um, most patients who are seeing any of our nephrologists, nephrologists publicly um, will be seeing them in the same area where this clinic's run from, so, from. So it's a very familiar area to these patients. The other clinic that's also run out of that area is the um, kidney supportive care clinic. And that's designed for patients who have a very high symptom burden but also for those patients who have decided that dialysis may not be from it for them when they get the time comes that they need to have renal replacement therapy. So they can be linked into that clinic um, and they get all the supports in that clinic, much the same as my clinic. They have linkage to the CNCs, the social worker, and also the dietitian. So in terms of renal, we very much uh, follow through our patients all the way. We like to work as closely as possible with any of our community agencies. So that is with yourself as practice nurses, as well as the general practitioners. Any letters that are generated from my clinic, I do actually send a copy along to the general practitioner. So they also have the information about what the patient may be considering in terms of renal replacement therapy in the future and anything else that we may have put in place for this patient in terms of their renal disease. Um, and I'll talk a bit further along uh, about the other staff within the department. I'll hand over to Glenn. Thanks, Kylie. Um, yeah, NG is very busy. You can see some of the complexity already. Um, so I'll try um, yeah, to add the cardiology perspective. But I think what's really important to realise, even though it seems there are lots going on, with NG, it's all interrelated. So all these conditions, as we pointed out in the middle with cardiorenal syndrome, um, the diabetes is gonna to contribute to heart disease, the heart disease is gonna to contribute to heart failure, to the atrial fibrillation, to, um, you know, the like, renal involvement's going to be involved in that too. So, so actually this isn't an uncommon mix of symptoms or mix of symptoms and the need to, for sort of specialty, but of course, you know, they're presenting to general practice as well. And 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 it can seem a bit overwhelming. There is a little bit of overlap, but um, I'll just go through some of the card cardiology aspects. So certainly on the presentation, the shortness of breath with the history of congestive cardiac failure um, and atrial fibrillation, um, you know, we're, we're, we're thinking really of, um, of What's the precipitant to maybe the atrial fibrillation getting a bit out of control, um, the actual ventricular rate going too high, and that's the precipitant to their um, heart function cause a bit of decompensation, a bit of um, pulmonary vascular congestion and the, short, the shortness of breath. So looking for a precipitant in terms of infection would, would be important. Certainly people with atrial fibrillation, um, are um at risk of um at risk of stroke um and so anticoagulation is extremely important um in this particular patient um uh with such high risk and with abnormal renal function um um that's that's going to be tricky with some of the newer um oral anticoagulants and sort of like warfarin would be a a consideration with 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 this gentleman, and this is on a background really of a, of a history of ischemic heart disease, which is probably what what like the driver is. So, from a cardiac perspective, we'd be looking at the ischemic heart disease um, causing the left ventricular dysfunction, um, and which in in turn you get a large dilated heart, and often with the with the atria dilating um, as well due to valvular dysfunction, um, you can get the atrial fibrillation. So, there's this real mix of of sort of of sort of symptoms which are going to um which are going into that like cardiovascular experience. So um from a management point of view um for cardiac would be certainly we knew that there was a background of moderate LV dysfunction with the atrial fibrillation and we'd be wanting to assess um if that's got any worse. So if his cardiac function has got any worse and certainly optimizing his cardiac medications, his heart failure medications um 
to um, to um, improve what what function he has. Um, you know, realistically, his end stage disease, his end stage, um, he'd be you know he's uh, approaching end stage kidney disease. He's certainly got um, got um, endocrine instability, and from a cardiac perspective, with that sim symptomatic heart failure is a approaching you know that like not completely in stage disease but um but with his other comorbidities it's getting quite difficult to manage and you'd expect that that over the next 12 months there's a high chance that, that he's going to have repeat hospital admissions so in terms of the self-care strategies we're trying to to sort of support him with as well as the diabetes and the like renal um it's sort of similar in terms of in terms of medication management i like to keep things fairly simple with all the heart patients because often they just want to know what to do and and we always say you, you just do four things that you should take your medications you don't smoke exercise every day and eat a healthy diet that's sort of that's quite broad but that will address most things that'll address um that'll assist with hypertension, that'll assist with weight management, that'll assist with inactivity, it'll assist with with like depression, with exercise being shown to sort of improve uh, mild to moderate depression, it'll improve their lipid profile. So those sort of simple messages I think are really important, particularly when someone's got a disease um, with multiple factors, in, including the endocrine, um, renal and cardiology. I think from our point of view, looking at their healthcare environment, so important they've got a GP. I mean, I'm always saying to the staff at the hospital, they've got to go back to someone. So make sure we know their GP, make sure it's the current GP. And so they can get that support in general practice. And the discharge summary has somewhere to go. Um, and it doesn't just go into like the ether. Um, the other thing was making sure they've got cardiology follow-up a cardiologist follow-up that can sometimes be tricky especially with people with limited um if if they've got limited finances the public clinics there are public clinics at st george which we'll mention but sometimes the waiting lists on those are quite prohibitive but there is a trio system i, I suppose more important is that social environment and this is where i think that with someone with that sort of stage five kidney failure and the heart failure people with um with heart failure have have about a 60 percent rate of mild cognitive impairment or worse so their ability to self-care really needs to really needs to, to like be assessed and certainly not taken for granted and this is where the wife really comes into play and and we would be really focusing and empowering um, and supporting his wife to support those self-care strategies, which in, in heart failure include a fluid restriction if they're taking Lasix, restricted salt environment, um, salt salt intake, which would be similar to the um, some of the um, the uh, renal aspects, but also um, but also maintaining physical activity. You know, if you don't use it, you lose it, and with someone who's maybe restricted. With their cardiac function we don't want them to lose their skeletal muscle function so just just pottering about encouraging any activity at all just walking about as long as, as safely is really important really important they can't just sit because they're just going to become sort of frailer and we know frailty is a indicator um, of poor outcomes so post discharge we'll be looking um we've got as well as inpatient we've got some home-based services so the heart support service where We've got a nurse practitioner who can see people at home to look at their medications and to provide support for self-care and 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 work with general practice um just to make sure people are on on optimal medications and importantly as i mentioned before this this gentleman's not well and there should be discussion about uh, advanced care directives about what what he would like and certainly um what would be what would be the chance if he if he did have a cardiac arrest in hospital, what would be the chance of, a, of one successful resuscitation, and then also to um, to um, if it was a successful resuscitation, what 
how he would be after that. And normally it wouldn't be better. Um, so, so they're really important conversations to like have just just to involve um, NG and 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 his like in his his like wife in sort of that um, future planning of a of three diseases which have um, which which are chronic. They have an illness trajectory, and realistically, he's you know, coming towards the end of that like trajectory. So we just need to sort of make sure that we um, that we're as transparent as we can. Yeah, thanks very much, Carly. Denise, do you want to talk about um, what you offer as an endocrine department? Uh, yeah, yes, yeah, sure. Um, so uh, in terms of the endocrine department, um, there's a number of uh, outpatient clinics. Um, we've got some private endocrinologists based at the hospital and the public clinics are held in the um, uh, um, Prince William Wing. So the diabetes, um, so just with the um, clinics in the outpatient department, we've got a um, diabetes clinic that's held once a week, medical clinic, and there's an endocrinology clinic held once a week. And there's also um, the, uh, the outpatient um, ward follow-up clinic that's held on a, a Friday morning. And we have a clinic for gestational diabetes on a Friday morning also. Diabetes Education Centre, um, that's in the Pritchard Wing, and we've got um, multidisciplinary staff, um, MDT, um, there. We've got the dietitian, um, and they just see insulin-treated patients and women with gestational diabetes and uh, other patients um, that you might refer to the hospital who have diabetes who um, are diet controlled or just on diabetes tablets, um, they're seen by the dietitian in uh, on level two of the um, Pritchard Wing Nutrition Department. We do have a psychologist, but they've got quite limited um, access. They we just have one day a week, and primarily they're looking at um, patients with type one diabetes. So. Um, we on um, in the within the diabetes centre, we also have a paediatric service. Um, with the paediatric service, um, they're they're separate from the adults, um, and they actually have um, three paediatric diabetes educators. Oh, sorry, three um, paediatric clinical nurse consultants. Um, so, sorry, I was lost my slides. Um, we service the wards. We've got diabetes educators that go to the wards and that's via a referral system and we obviously have a criteria for the sort of patients that we see in there. Next slide, Kylie. Um, and this has just got listed the, um, the service, diabetes service and clinical uh, nurse consultants should you need to contact um, myself or any of the paediatric um, CNCs. With the um, clinics, I just didn't mention that we do also have a um, transition and young adult clinic. So we have a um, transition clinic for um, teenagers 16 to 25 years. Um, so if you needed to refer somebody who fitted that criteria, it's just a matter of um, referring them the clinics held out of the outpatient department um, in the Prince William Wing. Thank you. So um, from the renal department perspective, um, we have nephrologists who work in the department um, who have uh, public clinics, as well as some of our nephrologists having private clinics um, spread across. Um, there's the Sutherland Shire um, and the Cogra vicinity. We also do have um, clinical nurse consultant led clinics that are run out of um, St. George Hospital. Um, so we've got a couple of dialysis units. We have the Four West Dialysis Unit, which is based in St George Hospital. That this is our sort of our in centre and more um, unwell patients. We have our Presenia Medical Care Unit, which is a satellite unit, which is um, in Town Square in Cogra, and that has hemodialysis patients as well as our home hemodialysis training unit. We also have a Sutherland satellite unit, which is based on the grounds of um, Sutherland Hospital, but is actually outside the hospital. 
And we also have our renal care center, which is based um, at St. George Hospital in a small cottage just um, between the private hospital and the mental health unit. And that's um, predominantly where our peritoneal dialysis training happens, as well as it houses our um, kidney supportive care team. Um, in From an inpatient setting, we have um, our inpatients usually residing on 4 South, which is actually a renal um, and gastroenterology ward, as well as um, our 4 West um, precinct. In terms of um, contact details, um, I've just put up the contact details. We have a department which is down in Montgomery Street, um, where our secretaries reside and where all of our referrals into the department come in. Um, we have our renal outpatient clinics, which is run up in the 4 West unit, um, just outside of where the dialysis is. And as mentioned, they're the other three units. Um, we have quite a few CNCs within the department. We have myself. Uh, we also have a renal transplant coordinator. We have a renal vascular access CNC, a peritoneal dialysis CNC, and um, they're renamed now the Kidney Supportive Care CNCs. And all of those CNCs are more than happy to be contacted um, by anyone who has patients that they have questions about or patients that might be known to us. Um, and we'd encourage you to call us anytime. Um, given that we are the sort of stable staff within the renal department generally um, in terms of sort of the junior doctors, we usually do know most of the patients. So we can usually help you navigate sort of the department probably a lot quicker sometimes than some of the junior doctors. Um, if you're wanting any more information in terms of um, kidney disease, um, I'd encourage you to sort of go onto the Kidney Health Australia website. Um, I use a lot of their resources for education for my patients. So if you um, do have patients who may be linked in with our department but may still have some questions, um, there is a lot of information here. We also do have a renal department um, website and the whole presentation will be available, made available to you after tonight. So you'll have all these numbers. So if you haven't been able to write them down, I'll hand back over to Glenn. Thanks, Kylie. Yes, yeah, so there's just various clinics in the outpatient department in cardiology. We have general pacemaker, heart failure, arrhythmia clinic, chest pain clinic, um, a TAVI clinic for transliminal aortic valve replacement and um, um, a, a cardiac catheter have um, have day only procedure and they, they um, have clinics there. Um, the inpatient ward is 5 West cardiology unit. That's about a 30 bed ward. Next slide, please. Um, some of the services, so are those inpatient services, the outpatient services offering diagnostic tests like cardiac echo, stress tests, stress echoes, Holt monitors, etc. Um, we have outpatient services. So um, there's an outpatient cardiac rehabilita rehabilitation service for those patients, um, mostly post um, either angiogram, angioplasty with stent and a bypass surgery, go to the cardiac rehabilitation. There's a heart support service which, um, which um, supports people with heart failure and that's a home-based service. Um, as well as um, implantation of cardiac defibrillators. There's um, there's two, well, there's myself as the, the cardiology consultant. There's also um, cardiac rehabilitation coordinators and heart failure uh, CNTCs as well to um, support patients. And certainly we'd be, we'd be thrilled to have any of the practice nurses give us a call, have a chat about any of the patients and, and, um, and, and I'd be able to network and and um, and help help improve patient care in any way. Next slide, please. Most of the resources we have, and there's some good patient information. Um, we comes from the National Heart Foundation. They've got good patient resources, and they've also got a cardiac rehabilitation directory, which can point you towards the local cardiac rehabilitation programs um, to to support patients after their cardiac event. Thanks. Hand over to Robin just to talk about Health Pathways. Thank you, Kylie. Just quickly, for those of you who are, have not used Health Pathways before, 
it is a web-based platform designed to support healthcare providers to deliver efficient and consistent care to patients. It offers up-to-date clinical information, referral pathways and local health information to assist all healthcare professionals, but primarily GPs, in making informed decisions about patient management and referrals. Next slide, please, Kylie. Thank you. So the, there are two Health Pathways teams that you can access and they are the Sydney Health Pathways team in the Sydney Local Health District and obviously the South East in Sydney as well. Um, both programs are there to help you and your practice colleagues with managing and supporting your patients effectively and ensuring the right care is provided depending on where your patient lives. So here on this slide, we've got our login details, web addresses, username and password, QR codes there to access both Health Pathways sites and we'll be providing uh, a copy of this information with, to take, with you to take tonight. Two important things to mention are that the username and the password will give you access to both Sydney and South East Sydney Health Pathways sites. And the second thing is to remember that the login details are strictly for healthcare workers and not to be shared or made available for the general public. Next slide, please. Thank you. So you can see here just a quick snapshot of pathways that you can expect to find on the Southeastern Sydney site relevant to today's discussions in the areas of cardiology, endocrinology, the pathways listed there have a diabetes focus, and then also the renal conditions. And the next slide, please, Kylie. You can see there, um, similarly, we can we have uh, conditions listed that you can find on the Sydney Health Pathways platform. Okay, next slide, thank you. So these are our team, um, our respective contact details for our team, Sydney and South East Sydney. So please get in touch if you have any difficulty accessing Health Pathways, or if you have any questions, we'll be happy to assist. Um, we were planning to do a live demonstration, but I'm not sure if there is time for that now. Uh, if not, please get in touch with us. We're more than happy to spend time with you individually or um, with your practices to go through health pathways to demonstrate usability and things like that. Thanks, Kylie. Okay, thanks everyone. Um, Denise, we do have a couple of questions here in regards to the endocrine side of things for the patient. Um, in regards to the HbA1c, when the patient um, presented, it was quite high. Is there any particular reasons that you could give us as to why a reading like that might be so high for a patient? Um, yeah, look, it could well be. Um, look, there are a number of um, there are a number of reasons. Um, it, it, look, perhaps the. Um, medication that the patient's been prescribed. Um, with the duration of diabetes, um, I suppose there's, there's two um, situations with diabetes. You've got um, reduced insulin secretion and also um, insulin resistance. So we know um, as the diabetes um, will disease process um, lengthens, then the pancreas can stop um, you know, producing enough insulin. So that's where it's quite important that people um, do have regular um, reviews by their, by their GP and by their um, endocrinology team. Now, um, I believe that NG hadn't had um, any sort of endocrinology input um, for some time. Um, and I'm actually not too sure on the frequency of follow-up um, with the GP. Um, so it could well have been just he, he wasn't on the appropriate um, medication because we know diabetes is a progressive condition and we know as the trajectory um, moves on, then we need um, different sorts of medication to, to really target what the issue is. Um, I think with NG, it probably wasn't that um, it, you know, his wife um, said that she was taking um, or giving the insulin, so it probably um, wasn't sort of around an adherence thing. Um, with patients, um, you know, with diabetes, often, um, you know, if they're not doing um, finger pricking um, frequently, um, you know, they get sick of doing it. Um, and sometimes, you know, if they're doing it and 
um, they're not engaging with the GP and sort of no actions occurring, then that can sort of, um, again, impact on, um, I suppose, the, well, again, insulin um, changes. So a lot of it is around um, what's what's happening with the disease process. Are you taking your insulin? Um, you know, we would have a look at his um, injection sites again. Um, is the insulin he's using, is it being absorbed? Um, we know that, you know, with illness, um, the, the counter-regular regulatory hormones, um, stress hormones certainly come into play. And if he's um, been unwell, which obviously he's got a lot of things going on, then that will certainly put his um, his uh, blood glucose levels up. So I don't think it's one particular thing. It could be sort of collectively a number of things. Um, but sort of what I've mentioned, they're, they're all considerations. And I think it just really highlights for people with diabetes, um, you know, when we're talking about key messages, you know, it's really important that they know their BGLs. They, they need to know what their blood glucose levels are. And more importantly, like understanding what their target range is and um, making sure when they go and see their GP or yourselves, um, in, in their rooms that they take their record books so that you can constantly look at them and see, you know, where, where glucose levels are trending and what do we need to do. Um, and, you know, if uh, NG, like I mean, he was on obtisolin, it's a fairly recent insulin. You know, sometimes we get people who are on the older types of um, insulin, things like the mixotards, um, and that can sometimes be suggestive that mm, this person probably hasn't had a review for quite some time. Mm. Okay, that's great. And I guess that highlights for um, nurses that are working in general practice how important their recall systems are as well, that if we do have diabetes patients within our practice um, to have a look at potentially HbA1cs and start recalling those patients back as well. Sure. Um, we just have another couple of questions here. So I'll just ask these last few. I'm conscious of the time. Um, in regards to, say, for example, a newly diagnosed diabetic and they've had an admission, um, do they get shown before discharge how to use <laughs> their insulin pens and have been sort of educated around their medications as well? Because quite often we get patients present back to general practice and they're really unsure potentially about their meds, how to use their devices um, or their pens. Yeah, sure. Um, look, you know, the referral criteria, um, nursing staff, medical teams, they, they are supposed to refer for patients um, newly commencing on insulin if you've got a change of insulin therapy um, or if there's some, you know, sort of um, concern around their self-management. So um, as a part of the, the practice of the inpatient diabetes educator, we wouldn't clear anyone for discharge unless they they have got safe self-care management. Um, so I wonder, you know, perhaps um, have some, some of these patients slip through. Um, what I'd suggest you do is have a look at your discharge summary. Um, um, does it actually, you know, in the plan, does it have anything about... Um, the sort of input, that, you know, the, the teams that the patient saw. And, um, you know, after tonight's um, discussion, you've got our contact number, you've got my contact number. So if you've got any patients um, that, that you're seeing that, that um, you feel haven't been seen, then please um, contact, contact me, contact the department and we'd prioritise them for a really sort of urgent appointment because, um, yeah, to my knowledge, um, all of the patients, they're referred to us and, um, as I mentioned, they shouldn't be cleared for discharge unless they're self-managing. And, you know, for those patients that live in the St George Sutherland area, we're really lucky because we actually have a nursing service, Clever Care, that is a free service for four weeks and um, we will refer the patients to that nursing service if needed. 
Okay, that's great. And what is the wait time for a patient to be able to get an appointment at the Diabetes Clinic or Education Centre? So uh, the Diabetes um, Medical Clinic, um, sort of further to what um, Glenn was alluding to, they do have uh, fairly long wait lists. Um, the diabetes clinic look it could be sort of four six months but I think the important thing there um, they our patients are triaged um, so if you if you've got a patient that you feel needs to be prioritized um, or the GP the GP can actually phone the hospital switch and ask to speak to the endocrinologist on call and um, it's it's the endocrinologists that are triaging their diabetes patients or when the GP are ref is referring the patients to the medical clinic, more importantly, make sure that the information really contains the, the, the reason that you'd be wanting a really prompt referral. That's really important. But if you've got anybody that is really symptomatic um, and, you know, GP might be a little bit unsure as to what might be the best medication, then... then um, there is that that opportunity, or you can page me and I can escalate that for you. Um, so there's a, a number of ways to to go there. And in terms of the Diabetes Education Centre, again, um, you just need to send fax a written referral to us and let us know what the problem is. Our wait time's not long. You know, for your patients, if they were discharged home without. Um, you know, instruction on their insulin pen, we'd get them in within a day or two. Otherwise, we triage the patient and it could be, you know, two or three weeks. So again, um, you know, if you, I'm available five days a week, so, so just call me um, or put a lot of detail um, in the referral letter and um, that will be triaged. Okay, thanks. That's great. We do have a, f a couple of other questions, but we might hold those over just because of time. Well, I'll submit those through and then we can send out the um, answers to those along with the additional resources if that's okay um, with everybody. So I'd just like to thank Kylie, Glenn, Denise and Robin for tonight. That was fantastic and a very informative webinar. So thank you so much. Lots of information in there. So if a patient does present to a general practice and we've got some questions, we can contact the CNCs within the hospital to try and get some support and some assistance. Absolutely. I think any of, yeah, and I think that's, doesn't just go for the three of us here tonight. I think any of the CNCs within the hospital, within any specialty, are more than happy to be contacted. And if it avoids a patient having to come through emergency for a hospital admission by them being able to make that phone call, then that's a bonus to all of us within our professions, I think. Yeah, absolutely. That's great. But I think also um, we'll be thrilled. We'll be thrilled. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I'm this is working. It's a sign that we're that you know that we've got a partnership. That sign that 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 um that we're working together, and that's what it should look like. It, that's what it should look like. So we'd be thrilled if if someone phones. You know, always always have. And even if it's not a phone call, even an email, just any yeah, any yeah. any way of communicating, because yeah. you know we're not always sitting at our desk. We are busy. It's but part of our emails, job. Yeah, it's part of our job. Part an our email job. will respond. Yeah, phone call, leave a message, we'll respond. But I think yeah, I think that's the biggest take-home message is we're more than happy to be contacted about anything that they want to know. And like um, Denise has already mentioned, you know, by making that phone call or making that email, we can usually expedite situations based on information that we've received. Like we know that things come through a fax machine and, you know, they don't really give a good explanation of what you're actually after. I think having that verbal conversation sometimes can go, oh, okay, well, we know the right person to escalate this to to get this person seen quicker than they, you know, might have been seen if that piece of paper just sat there and got triaged. Okay. That's great. Thank you. And just with Health Pathways, um, anyone can also contact us here at Cessman and we can definitely link you in with the program also. 
So our next webinar in this series will be held on Thursday, the 25th of July, with that topic being respiratory and emergency presentations. So please continue to look on our website for further details about this. If you could also please remember to complete the evaluation survey. We appreciate your feedback and ongoing support. And I'd like to thank everybody for attending tonight and enjoy the rest of your evening. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thanks.